Good afternoon, good morning, good evening uh, to all of you, and welcome to the YWP Get Together. Our topic today is Young Water Professionals Intergenerational Stories, and we'll be discussing entrepreneurship and WASH. This Get Together is organized by the YWP Steering Committee, so you have here in the slides the photos of all the members of the Steering Committee. They will be representing the IWA Young Water Professionals Community from 2022 to 2024. And if you want to join the community and learn more about the Young Water Professionals and what IWA is doing for them, I invite you all to scan the QR code and follow our activities there. Next. Before we start the webinar, just some um, quick information about it. Uh, this event is being recorded and it will be available on demand in our website, um, similar to the presentation slides and any other material and information that the speakers uh, want to, to share with the participants today. Uh, the speakers are also responsible for securing copyright permissions and everything that is presented here are sole responsibility of the speakers. So now the trick part of it. Um, if you want to make questions for uh, the panelists, I ask that you submit this question via the Q&A box. So you can check in your Zoom uh, application, the Q&A box. So please use it to send questions to the panelists. And if you want them to know your name, you can also write your name there. So for example, my name is Isabella and I have a question for Dr. Abigail. And she will know that this question is from me directly to, to her. And the chat box uh, is for general requests and interactive activities. So feel free to present yourself, say where you're from, and even your expectations for this um, event. And for the participants, your microphones uh, are muted and we cannot respond to the raise hand option. So without further delay, I will hand over to Jacob. Jacob is the chair of the YWP Steering Committee and he will be our moderator today. Jacob. Thank you, Isabella. It's, it's nice to be here once again. <laughs> um, so today we are going to um, hear from our speakers and uh, we have here Dr. Abigail Wilson. She's a clinical pharmacist and co-founder of Infitech Lab, a water management company. Then we will hear from Dr. Thiago Bressani. He is director at Shenicharo and Bressani Consultancy and Training in Sanitation. Then we will hear from Dr. Akanimo Odon, He's the Africa Strategy Advisor at Lancaster Environment Center in Lancaster University in the UK. Then we'll hear from Dr. Barry Liner, is the Chief Technical Officer, Officer at the Water Environment Federation and Facilitator at Unleash Innovation Lab for the SDGs. So welcome again to all our speakers. So for our agenda, we will, go, we will have a poll, we will have the first um, presentation, then the second one, then the third and the fourth. Then we have another poll. We will have um, a general discussion, a Q&A at the end of the presentations. Then um, we will have final remarks and conclusion. Thank you. Next slide. So let's have our first poll. So are you a WASH entrepreneur? In one word, you can state the challenges that um, young WASH entrepreneurs face. But we've given you some options already. Mentorship, technical support, funding, team management. So you can choose the one that um, best resonates with you. So you have two minutes to choose your options. Great, so we have about um, half of us being WASH entrepreneurs, that is great. And um, the major challenge is funding, followed by team management and technical support and mentorship. I'm sure by the time that we finish the presentations, we will have answers to most of our challenges. Next slide, please. 
Yes, so we will have the first presentation from Dr. Abigail Wilson. So, Abigail, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. And thank you so much, IWA, um, for giving me the opportunity to be here today um, and to represent Infotech Lab Ghana. And I'll be sharing um, what we have been working on as a business project, as a water sustainability project in Ghana. Um, so you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So I'll be speaking on ending overflow of water storage, um, water storage tanks and then bridging um, water and gender gap. So this first video is going to tell you guys more about what we have done so far and who we are as a water sustainability company. You can go ahead and play the video. Yeah. To ensure regular availability of water, individuals spend approximately $4,000 and larger communities through NGOs, local assemblies, and philanthropists spend approximately $15,000 to drill, complete the wells, and have water pump and water storage tanks installed for them. After completion of this project, users usually get to know when their storage tanks are empty during situations when they need to use the water, and then their tasks are not running. They manually switch on their pumps to initiate the tank filling process, and to know if the tanks are full, they are notified only when the tanks overflow, thereby causing them to lose water. It is sad to know that Individual homes lose an average of 4,000 liters of water per month, and larger communities lose averagely 35,000 liters of water per month due to the overflow of their water storage tanks. In providing convenience, preventing the frequent breakdown of water pump systems due to the dry run of the pump, and sending water to our end users, Intech Lab Limited decided to design and manufacture aquasets. Hi, I am Obedjai. Together with Mr. Fred Yapanube and Dr. Abigail Wilson, we are the founders of Intech Lab Limited. Along with our team in Ghana, we are the manufacturers of Aquaset. Aquaset automates the pump actions such that it delivers the exact volume of water needed as determined by the user to fill their water storage tanks, thereby preventing the overflow of water storage tanks when full. It will interest you to note that since the inception of this project, Aquaset has saved approximately 2.2 million liters of water with only 20 units deployed. Thank you so much, Jacob. You can go ahead to the next slide. So I think from the video, um, you guys have a good idea on who we are as Infotech Lab and then what our goals and our projects are about and what we've been able to do so far. So I would just recap that. Um, so far in, in regards to ending overflow of water storage tanks and also bridging water and gender gap, we've been able to research homes. We did research homes, about 100 homes, and then universities, and then schools in Ghana. And basically, since the launch of our water device, which is Aquaset water device, we've been able to save almost um, 4 million liters of water. Um, for some reason, I'm not able to see the entire part of the slice, but we've been able to save that much water um, just by deploying, you know, few number of units of our water devices. So that is what we've been able to do so far. Um, the next slide. And how does our water sustainability projects or business impact economic and productivity transformation? So we are able to help prevent aquifer dryouts. We are able to ensure that there is constant water available to people in the community. Um, we are also able to conserve water. And also we educate our members in the community and then in schools and universities, especially in Ghana, since they tend to use more of the water storage tanks, which in Ghana we call them poly tanks. Most of the institutions or high schools, university campuses, hospitals usually have poly tanks on their campuses and that is where they get water from. So we, are, we take intentional steps to educate them on ways that they can also conserve water. Um, and then we also prevent dry running of water pump systems, saving our users on average $45 on pump repairs annually. And also making sure that our water um, device ensures sustainability water withdrawal from the aquifer. So we can go ahead to the next slide. So in regards to gender and water, 
Um, once we started a uh, water device business or projects, we noticed that through research and engagements with our members in the community, in schools, um, in hospitals, we realized that the females were deeply affected by lack of access to water. So we had conversations with them and most of them will give us information about how water affects their personal hygiene as females. And most of us are already aware that when it comes to personal hygiene, women or females go through menstrual cycle phases, which doesn't happen for the men, right? Um, and the UN, the United Nations has also established um, a research on this where it talks about how nearly 90% of homes in rural areas in Africa have no access to pipe water and collecting water for daily usage also um, weighs heavily on women. Now, when we did our research and engagements with uh, the women in institutions and campuses, we realized that they came out with a higher number talking about how they cannot take shower, they cannot afford not to take showers when they're going through their personal hygiene phase, the menstrual cycle phase, compared to the men where men, the men that we interviewed, we interviewed about um, 30 men. They said they could go three days without water. It wasn't a problem. And then the other 30 women that we interviewed, they said they couldn't afford to go two days without taking showers, especially when they're going through their menstrual cycle phase. They cannot afford to do that. We also interviewed some of these women in um, healthcare institutions. In Ghana, one of the major healthcare institutions in Ghana is called Kolebu Teaching Hospital. And some of the women we interviewed there, they were talking about how sometimes when they go for certain lab work to be done in regards to their health checkups, sometimes they will need to use restrooms they would need access to water to wash themselves, to wash their hands, to wash their private part um, in regard to help them participate in certain health check um, lab work that needs to be done by the doctor. And also the women that go through maternity, the women that go through labor at the hospitals, most of them need access to water to help them have a comprehensive or um, a comprehensive health well, uh, wellness checkup right, with their doctors and healthcare providers in the healthcare institution. So when they get there and there isn't access to water, it becomes a barrier to their healthcare needs, right? Um, it affects them. And with the, with the students on campuses who do not also have access to water and struggle with access to water, when they don't have water to, they also struggle. It affects their productivity. When they are supposed to be thinking about um, studying, they are instead, their brains are occupied with how am I going to get access to water, to be able to shower, to take care of my personal hygiene needs, especially when I'm going through that menstrual cycle phase. They would rather be fixated on fixing that issue than paying attention to their books, right? So that whole lack of access to water cycle affects their productivity, especially the women. Um, and then it also affects their healthcare needs when we look at the, the healthcare challenges in regards to water that women especially face when they go to their um, healthcare institutions to seek for healthcare. So what our water device is doing is the water that would have been lost due to overflow of storage tanks, we are making sure that we are conserving that water. We are making sure that we are saving those water so that they can be used to bridge some of these gaps that are already in the system. It doesn't make sense that we are losing over 2.2 million liters of water every month in our communities, in our schools, um, and then in our homes, it's about 4,000 liters of water per month. It doesn't make sense that we are losing that much of water every month when we can actually do something about it by coming up with a water device that will address, specifically address those gaps, right? So that is what Infotech Lab is all about. We are making sure that we're coming up with this device to help bridge all those water gaps. So the next slide. What has been our biggest challenges or barriers since we decided to embark on this um, journey in regards to addressing these water gaps. So capital, um, 
access to funding um, has been one of our biggest hiccups. Um, our water device project is basically capital intensive. Unfortunately, it is capital intensive for a small water startup company. And so we've, we've had difficulty um, being able to ex explore or deplore our solutions to all the different regions in the country. And one of the ways that we are working on right now, strategically working on to bridge that gap is to leverage on collaborations and partnerships with WASH organizations that already exist in the country, like the Ghana Water Company, and also making sure that we are collaborating with international organizations that support what we do and the WASH agenda. So being able to do that is one of the ways that we are helping to strategically bridge that lack of access or access to funding gap. And also making sure that um, we are leveraging on working with um, grants organizations, organizations that offer grants. We are making sure that we have a strategic grant team that specifically target organizations that offers grants to um, wash organizations or wash businesses or entrepreneurs so that they can help us deplore our um, our initiative or our solution across all boards, not only in Ghana, but also in Africa as a whole. Um, next slide. So our biggest objective here at Infotech Lab is to create and raise um, awareness on water barriers and its impacts on economic transformation and gender disparities. And making sure that there is constant water availability in water stress and water scarce areas. We also do believe in that improvements to wash at home, school, work, and in public spaces um, also support gender equity, which I spoke about earlier. Women and girls must also play a central role in designing and implementing solutions so that services um, respond to their specific needs, right? And that is one of the key factors that we took into consideration when we were de developing our water device. We made sure that we engaged and also did a survey on the women and the men in the communities that we are serving, right? To actually identify what specifically is hurting them in the communities when it comes to lack of access to water and how do we bridge that gap? Um, we also believe Africa Water Vision 2025 is achievable with Aquaset using our technology. We can sustainably withdraw water from aquifers aquifier dry outs, prevent water loss, and create awareness on water con um, conservation. And we want to create a legacy in Africa. Infotech Lab, we are so determined to create a legacy in Africa. We want to be part of Africa's history as creator of solutions to address and their ch um, the, the challenges that Africans face. My name is Dr. Abigail Wilson, and thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson, for that um, presentation and then um, telling us what you do at Infotech Lab and the challenges and how you are dealing with it. So moving on, we will hear from Dr. Barry Lina. So Barry will talk to us about Unleash, a global innovation network, the perspectives from a global partner. So Barry. Thank you very much, Jacob. So yes, um, I'm here to talk about the Unleash program, which is a, a global innovation and uh, entrepreneurship lab around the sustainable development goals. Next slide, please. Unleash programs started out of Denmark, uh, really focusing on all the SDGs and trying to uh, attract young professionals from 18 to 35 um, to try to solve problems on the SDGs. Um, through um, human-centered design and, and design thinking and entrepreneurship. There are um, a number of partners, hundreds of partners uh, across the world um, for uh, Unleash. And then related to SDG 6, I think uh, we know many of the partners um, who work together all the time, such as IWA, WEF, um, uh, Sing um, Stockholm International Water uh, Institute, Imagine H2O, and, and PUB um, uh, in Singapore. Next slide. The Unleash program uh, 
which I'm a facilitator in and a mentor for a couple of the programs. Um, it starts with, has an uh, innovation lab, which um, is about a thousand talents from 170 countries around the world, um, all brought together in one place for a week long program around uh, design thinking. And then um, there's also the Unleashed Plus, which is a accelerator for businesses that have come out of uh, the Unleashed Lab or other uh, other opportunities, uh, other businesses that are that come from participants in the Unleashed Lab um, that uh, that can that, that can start in, that have started a new business. Um, then then. Um, once we hit the pandemic, um, started with Unleash Hacks online um, and smaller programs, instead of a thousand people, we have 30 or 40 people uh, working on that over two weekends in a, in a row. And of course, um, once there, once you've participated in this, you've become part of the Unleash community, the alumni, um, and there's over 5,000 uh, alumni now that are um, that are connecting all over the world. So one of the, um, so the, the innovation process, the entrepreneurship and the design thinking process, uh, process that is taught is, um, you know, starts with problem framing to really understand the, what's going on from a human centered design and empathy mapping and everything. So we don't design um, solutions looking for a problem that we actually help people design a uh, solution for a specific problem by really understanding what that, that problem is. And then the, um, then the process moves into ideation, looking for trying to come up with as many ideas as possible, and then down selecting them to find the, um, to find the best uh, idea to kind of move forward with. And then prototyping, um, once you have your idea, um, prototyping to see what, what we can, what needs to, so we can set up and test it. And then testing, refining and implementing, you know, rolling things out. And what you'll notice is with all of this is a, um, this isn't a linear process. Uh, it goes back and forth. So you, as, as you learn more information, you're gonna have to go back to problem framing to understand things. As you learn information from prototyping and testing, you're going to modify it so you have new ideas that are going to come up. So it's a it's a an iterative process, but a structured process, putting the customer at the center and basically trying to drive innovation and entrepreneurship um, around these social challenges of the SDGs. Next slide, please. Yeah, <clears throat> one of the um, educate one of the tools that we use with the with the uh, participants, which are called who are called talents, is the is activity cards. So basically, broken down a very complex um, design thinking construct, and then put it into about fifty, you know, basically note card size bulleted activities to to bring people along that journey. Uh, so that's it, it's something that all the um, that all of the talents take away from this is having gone through this, this training without having to have like a 700 page book on design thinking or anything like that, but something very tight and um, uh, that, they, that they can reference in the future. Next slide. So Unleash started in uh, 2017 with a, with a thousand talents brought to in, in Denmark and in 2018, uh, another another thousand were sent to Singapore, and 2019 was uh, the Shenzhen Lab. Uh, so, where actually I was a facilitator for the SDG Six track, and had the pleasure of working with Jacob, who was one of the talents in in 2019 and Unleash. Um, over the um, you know when the pandemic started, uh, everything went virtual, so we had smaller hacks. And, uh, and then the Unleashed Plus um, was, has been virtual since 2020. And then 
this year, now that we're back moving around again, uh, in August, there was a lab for about 200 people from our, all around the Arctic that was hosted in Greenland. And one of the reasons it was hosted in Greenland is, is because Greenland is 85% indigenous. It's a majority um, indigenous country. Um, so it was really focused on trying to solve challenges in the Arctic. And then the global lab is going to be the first two weeks in December in India this year. Um, and virtual um, Unleash Plus has been going on with about 86 teams um, throughout the year. And then there's also been some hacks that have happened along the way. Next slide. So want to really talk about the people. Um, you know, when you get together and learn, um, a, a go through a very intense workshop, um, you know, five, five to seven day workshop around uh, design thinking, you know, to come up with a, a solution, you're probably not going to have a come up with a viable business opportunity to move forward right away. Um, it takes a while for those to, to basically um, to mature and evolve. And here's a, a couple of examples here. The first one um, is uh, AI in water. It is a uh, artificial intelligence um, a company out of uh, Chile and, um, and Mexico. Uh, and uh, the founder is um, Camilo Venegas. Uh, Camilo was actually at uh, in Shenzhen at the Talent with with Jacob, and um, over uh, over time, the connections that uh, Camilo made from that um, he was able to form a company a couple of years ago, and now they are. Uh, in this, they're raising money in the seed round, and they already have uh, 12 major uh, customers in uh, in Chile, um, the largest pork producer, um, industrial operators, wineries in in Chile. So now they're getting some traction, and they're trying to move throughout the rest of the Americas as before they go global. But so they're in the process in the raise round right now and moving forward. Another group. Um, that is IO Tank, and one of their um, participants um, uh, was in uh, Singapore and uh, and Shenzhen as talents, and then they formed this company. IO Tank is remote uh, monitoring of uh, septic and fat soils and greases. Um, and they've got a, a, a company, they've also been an alumni of Imagine H2O Accelerator. So they are working now into heavy commercialization um, and they've got their funding taken care of and they are now working into uh, commercialization. Now I would also, I saw a comment that said somebody is gonna be in a leash in India. Con um, congratulations. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you there. Um, speaking of people who will be there, uh, a perfect example of this is Jacob, who was a talent in Shenzhen in 19, um, and then didn't use exactly what came out of the, um, the, the workshop then, but actually has developed a, uh, a business and, and program at the WASH Advancement Center, which was in the um, Unleashed Plus virtually this year and has just been selected as one of the top 25 teams that will be taken to India um, and for the boot camp in India. So congratulations to Jacob for that. If I would have known in advance, I would have been able to put this on the, on the slides here. And one of the key things about this is this network that it creates between all of these young professionals worldwide and even experienced professionals like myself um, when we connect uh, to, to try to solve these problems using entrepreneurship, um, like uh, it, you know, we're always, I, I could go to about, probably about 160 countries in the world and be dropped off and through that Unleashed Network, be able to, um, you know, basically connect with anybody, spend the night at somebody's house or something to that effect. Um, 
So Jacob, will, one of Jacob's old um, partners from Shenzhen, I'm in San Francisco today, and I was able to meet with, with one of the people um, that was in Shenzhen and Singapore, we were just able to text somebody and say, hey, I'm gonna be in Singapore and pop in and, and meet with these people all around the world. And the connections that they make are leading to these companies like AI and Water, IO Tank, and, um, and the WASH Advancement Center. So um, I'll be happy to answer any questions in the, in the Q&A section. But it's a ph phenomenal program, and you definitely can talk to Jacob as somebody who's been in the uh, in the talent side, um, or me, or any of the other partners who are working from the facilitator and mentor side. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Barry, for that um, presentation. I can attest to the fact that um, the Unleash Innovation Program has very, been very helpful to my entrepreneurship journey. So it's something that I would um, ask all of us here to explore because um, I'm very sure that you're going to benefit from it. So we move on to, I know the majority of the of us mentioned that funding is one of the challenges that we face the most. So we are going to listen um, to a short video from Dr. Akanimo Odon. He's going to talk about how to approach fundraising and I believe um, it's going to be an interesting one. So let's take a listen. Okay, my name is Akan. I'm just uh, doing a little recording with respect to um, a little webinar um, for the graduate coders in the graduate coders group. I just given this session just not, not, not long before now, but I just felt maybe I'll just do it again, capture it in video. Because I think it's too important. And, and there's a reason why I think so. There is a there's there's too much money. There's the availability of a lot of resources, and people just don't access them. I don't like it when people say there's no availability of resources. There's no money. There's no money. Sometimes it's not really about the availability of resources, but the accessibility of the same. I mean, are you ready? If you're looking for money, how ready are you looking for money? So I want to use the next twenty minutes or so just to capture a very very high level highlight of specific things you need to have in place if you're looking for money okay first and foremost i don't like calling it money i want to call it resources because i might not have money in the pocket or in the bank but if i'm able to achieve everything i need when i need it and in time i still have resources so my point is so i give an example i travel all the time and i go for different things and different events most of the time, I never actually spend the money from my pocket. So if somebody needs you enough to pay for it, it's comparable to giving you money. But in this sense, you are able to do what you need to do and when you need to do it without having to use your own money. So it's access to resources. That's very important. So never look at grants or funding just only from a monetary point of view, cash, dollar. Also view it from a point of the availability of resources, or materials to do what you need to do at the right time. I'm not saying don't ask for money or apply for money, but never it be cloud, uh, never allow it be cloud your judgment or your understanding of funding. Okay, that's the first thing. Secondly, now you can't apply for money if you're disorganized. I'm sorry. If somebody wants mm -hmm. to give you money, the person expects you to be a bit more, a bit more ready. You know what I mean? A bit more prepared to show them what you need to use the money for. Except it's just some bonanza, you know, just giving you money. But if somebody is put together a financial package of some sort or a grant, a grand call, it's, it's, it's based on the back of a lot of meetings and, and strategies and with a specific objective in mind. And so I won't just give my money just to anybody just, just around the corner. I want to know clearly that the person applying for this money is actually ready to use the money to do what the money was intended for. That's too important. And so you cannot be disorganized when you say you're looking for money. I don't understand the, the rationale for that. So let's talk about being organized when you're trying to get funding. Okay. Now, I need to understand that, that, that there are different kinds of funding. Okay. That is applying for small grants, grants to go for a seminar, uh, go for a workshop, go for a training, go for an event. You know what I mean? There are grants for like little, little projects, so like one month, two month, three month, four month type projects. 
But then there are other kinds of grants. There are grants for major projects, big grants for two, one year, two years, three, even to five year type projects. And so fundamentally, the more the money you are asking for or you are looking for, the more the documentation is required to back up the reason you need the money and why you will be able to spend the money doing what you say you would. And it also means, therefore, the level of preparation and, 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 and putting your place, yourself organized to apply for it also increases. Okay, So it's okay to apply for small grants, £10,000 or some amount of money. So that's fine. But for me, I mean, at this point in my life or my career, I don't want to go for small money. That's fine. I want, I want to spend some time preparing and go for the big grant so I've got a longer project to work on. I'm not saying it's wrong to apply for small grant. That's also fine. But my point is, you can't apply for grants whichever way and not have a level of preparation for those. So, let's talk about preparation. Now, the first thing you need to know, you need to know who is giving money. It just makes logical sense. If I asked you now and said, in your field, in chemistry, who gives money around chemical projects or around chemical travels or chemical conferences? Do you know? If, if you say you are in, I don't know, in a, um, um, business, business management, you like to go for business strategy or enterprise, SMEs, who actually gives money around SMEs? Whether it's for a project, it's for a conference, a seminar, a scholarship, do you know? So first thing, you need to know who actually gives money. You can just keep saying, I don't have money, I don't have money, and you have no idea who actually gives cash. So if I were you, my first thing I would do is, do an Excel spreadsheet, comprehensive document of everybody who gives money within your field. Do a long list, break it down even, even to small grants, medium-sized grants, and even the big ones, as long as you know who gives money. Do a simple Google search and break it all down. That's the first thing. Now, secondly, you need to know the people who give money. Not, 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 not only know who they are, but know what, what they are made of. What is their mandate, their vision? What is their objective? What is their mission? Why do they give money? When did they give money? I mean, it just makes sense. If somebody gave you grants or gave a grant call last year in April and gave a grant call this year in April and you checked and the year before that was also in April, doesn't it make sense that there's a potential this person might give a call next year, April? So why do you have to wait until February, March, you just bump into this call, you go, I'm in a hurry. No, that dude, that donor gave that same money or that same call the same period of time the last three years. So you would know this if you get to know who gives money. Find out what do they do? Why do they give money? There is always a political, emotional, strategic premise around grants. There's always a commercial strategy around giving money. Don't you just, just give money just, for, just, just, for, just, just for, 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 for the fun of it. There's always a backdrop. Find out why have they put that funding call together in the first place. You would know this if you've gone to their website. Now, once you've known that, then begin to prioritize in your Excel spreadsheet what calls to expect, when to expect them, and why you should expect them. And now, it's also important, try and register or subscribe to their newsletters. They always almost seem to have newsletters. Like they will tell you subscribe. And maybe once every maybe every, every week or once every month or every quarter, they send newsletters to the people that are subscribed to these. Now it's, it's interesting. Most newsletters will have an idea or a sense of what they are thinking about a next proposal or a next grant call or a next funding opportunity. So even before the call comes out, some newsletters would actually capture that we're thinking about this new call and get prepared. That's the first thing. Subscribe to newsletters. Second, you need to have these guys who give money within your purview, around you. Are they having events? Go for it. Are they having conferences, webinars? Sign up for it. You need to know and be in the circle of people who give money. And not only that, you also need to know the people who potentially apply for these monies. You know why? Because at the end of the day, when everybody leaves the room and go individual locations and the grant call comes out, what normally happens? These guys automatically become your competitors. 
There's no other place to know who is thinking or planning what with respect to a potential call than being in the midst of them. You have to go for meetings. Have an idea of who is trying to apply for this next call and why. And guess what? It's not only about negative. It's also the best time to know, for example, who to pitch as potential partners on those calls. Whether it's small grants or big grants, it's how you know who is thinking about them, who shows up for the meetings. Find out, okay, my, my goodness, that guy has a specialty, a bigger strength than me. But maybe I have a strength they don't have. Then you can propose, can we form a consortium? It's better to get a partner for a call than go on your own. If getting the partnership will make the call work. So always try and be within the purview or environment or within the focus area of who gives money. Very important. Now, one of the big issues around applying and winning grants, I've noticed, is the fact that you are overwhelmed with documentation. And somebody will tell you, why is it that these calls always have so much requirements and you have to fill many forms and so on? So, so if you had money, you don't want to have a clear idea of who is applying for it. And so the only way these grant donors or donors can actually know who is serious and credible is through documentation. I mean, these guys don't live in your house. How would they know? You have to show them clear justification of why you are the right person to be given that money and you will spend it appropriately and effectively to deliver the impact you said it would. It's too important. And so don't get overwhelmed by documentation. The reason you get overwhelmed is because you are never really prepared in advance for when the call comes out. And so for me, I want to make, paint you a picture. Some specific documentations you need to have, whether a call is here or not. For example, your CV. If you have a five-page CV, try and get a two-page CV. Most big calls will ask you to summarize into a two-page CV. Now, you might think that's very infinitesimal, or quite insignificant, but trust me, it's quite a lot of work to have a five-page CV and under a short time frame, you have to condense it into two pages. Then issues like, oh my goodness, what do I choose that is relevant into these two pages becomes an issue. If you're under pressure, you present the two-page CV that capturing as much information for the particular proposal as you would because you're under pressure. Why not spend some time, have a range of CVs, two-page CV, that's what it requires, three-page CV, four-page CV. Try and spend time preparing for proposals so you are ready. A CV. This one is executive summary. Yes, if it's a business proposal or for an NGO or development project, they normally request for an executive summary. What is the, the, the simple overview captured in one page of what you want to do when you are given the money? For research proposals, they normally ask for an abstract. I mean, how would you capture in very simple terms, short premise, of why you won the grant and what you do it with okay so that's very important so understand your premises now a proposal some people will call it case for support so it's broken to different levels your introduction the background what's the problem you're trying to solve i mean why is that a problem investigate some trends some figures some data if you need to to paint a clear picture quite quickly of why it's important this is resolved. That goes in your background. Then it goes to what? Your objectives. What do you aim to achieve? If this, at the end of the day, you have this project, what do you want to solve? Some will go as far as kind of requesting for references. Oh yes, absolutely vital. So try and prepare a list of references. If it's a small proposal, they will ask for a little reference from your for former lecturer or for my employer or current employer. So why not prep them in advance? So, okay, well, a call may come, I might ask for a reference. Is it possible you prepare something in advance? If that's too much trouble, at least they know. The trouble is, you now look at, see a grant call, you're not in a hurry. Oh, I need to get a reference from my, my lecturer in Uniben. Or you have to now travel a long distance to go and look for that person. And the time is going. No! Why do you have to wait until you see the call? If you know generically this will be requirements that will be asked for, then prepare for them. On my laptop, I've got a list of references. In fact, I've gone as far as actually speaking to partners to get like frameworks of support letters and all and, the, and only their permissions. 
and all they will ask me to do is okay okay doc okay when the call comes out let us know and we can do a refreshing to fit the call because you will know your competence and your capacity and we've been engaged with this proposal get engaged with partners okay now so now besides that some will request for support letters so a support letter is a part is a letter from a, a potential partner or current partner to show their support for the proposal you're trying to put forward to ask for money so try and speak to these guys and get an idea of what their support might be why not it's important and interestingly it's in support letters you see things like in-kind contribution so if a partner has a free venue and he can contribute that to the project that is like potentially an in-kind contribution now you could actually estimate that monetarily and put it in the proposal to say that oh by the way even though i'm asking for money i've spoken to different partners and they are given different in-kind contribution to support this project you know the beauty of a donor getting a proposal and a proposal you specify the in-kind contribution and even estimate it monetarily that's quite powerful it shows that you have a vested interest in seeing that project work enough for you to find a partner who will contribute something not necessarily cash but something of value into the project but you can only know this if you engage with them in advance okay now the bigger the project the more documents they will ask for so for example thank you um i've posted the link to the full video in the chat so you can follow it after the session and then watch to the end i believe what you've watched so far has been insightful and um, there are lots more to learn from that video so we move on to our last <laughs> today um listening to dr diego bersani um who speak about the roadmap of the reference center on sustainable seaweed treatment plants diego thank you very much uh jacob for the introduction and I'm sure that spirits are high, still high for this last presentation after those very interesting talks. And so I will take you around 10 minutes to speak in the name of the Reference Center on Sustainable Sewer Treatment Plant and share with you, uh, we can go to the next one, please, and, and share with you our roadmap, actually, that guides us from academia to entrepreneurship. So the Reference Center uh, on Sustainable Sewer Treatment Plants, you see our logo in Portuguese in the right-hand side of this uh, slide, was born, in, was born beginning uh, this year after what we call a, uh, as a long incubation period. So the center, actually the Reference Center, is a spin-off company or a startup derived from the Brazilian uh, National Institute of uh, Sustainable Sewer Treatment Plants, the one that you see uh, the logo in the left-hand side of the of this uh, slide. So this uh, Brazilian National Institute was coordinated by uh, the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil, of course, and then putting together other six strong universities uh, in the country. So maybe a, a short note here. Uh, so in Brazil, we refer to the today very well-known uh, water resource recovery uh, facility as sustainable sewer treatment plant, but it's the same thing. So from 2017 to uh, March this year, the team of the Reference Center uh, was directly involved in that national institute. So this I will uh, explore a bit further in the coming slides. One very important thing here is that we dare to have such a powerful name, so Reference Center, even though as a young group, as you can see in this slide, because we believe that the Reference Center, this startup company can help shaping the transition to a circular economy in the sanitation sector of Latin America. Okay, so at the Reference Center on Sustainable Sewer Treatment Plants, we, we had the opportunity to close this uh, intergenerational gap within our borders. So we are a group of, five, we can go one, one next, please. We are a group of five uh, young water professionals holding masters and PhDs in the wash field. So, and then we invited a senior professional to join us in this venture. But how was this possible? How could we uh, make this uh, invitation? So by building trust between generations when we share the same goals. This is a key uh, thing. 
So Professor Carlos at the center of this image at the left hand side of these slides was the coordinator of that Brazilian National Institute that I showed. And my colleagues you see in this uh, slide were as we use it to call the executive team of that institute. So we can go uh, one further please. Um, I mentioned that uh, sharing goals is essential for building uh, this uh, intergenerational uh, trust. And we paved it this way during our incubation periods, as I mentioned, focusing on three kinds of contributions. So we were, uh, it's important to mention that we were inside the university during the time of the Brazilian National Institute. So the first goal was to publish information in national publications of wide circulation in the technical field, fields, such as those you see in the, in the slides, and eventually also uh, international publications, as, as this uh, book published by uh, IWA on anaerobic reactors for mainstream sewage treatment at uh, the left hand side of the corner of the slide. So we've been collecting very nice feedback from practitioners and also people in academia related to those publications. We can go uh, one slide further, please. A second shared goal was to develop uh, low cost equipment that fulfill local needs, uh, local Brazilian needs of the sanitation sector, such as low cost automatic samplers, which you see in the left hand side of the slide, three phase separators for USB reactors at the center of the slides, and low cost probes for total solid detections, for instance, at the right hand side. So those two products, uh, the automatic sampler and the three phase separator at uh, the left hand side of the slide, were eventually patented and they are commercially available right now in the Brazilian market. And here I have to mention that cross collaboration was a key element. So we put together industry, service providers and academia to come up with tailor made solutions for the national sector. So we, we, we knew the problem in advance and then we put those actors together in order to come up with solutions. We can go one further, please. And besides those products that uh, I showed you, uh, software for managing anaerobic based uh, sewage treatment plants were also developed during that uh, incubation period. And those softwares, they focus on the transition to a circular economy. Again, via the bridges that uh, we built between these uh, different institutions, those free online platforms were made available. The left hand side, we have uh, biogas estimation uh, software, uh, biogas is uh, software for estimating uh, the production in uh, anaerobic reactors and in the right hand side we have a software for uh, calculate carbon footprint on mainstream anaerobic uh, plants and uh, we can go one further please uh, the last but not the least goal of that shared intergenerational uh, goals that i mentioned before was to foster changes in uh, the regulation so in the national uh, regulation level and also the uh, Brazilian state regulation level. So for that, uh, our, our group was directly involved in the technical scientific discussions for establishing criteria and procedures for the production and applica application of biosolids and soils, and also in the guidelines for the direct reuse of non-potable water from uh, sewage treatment plants. So at academia at that time of the Brazilian National Institute were directly involved in those technical scientific discussions. And those two pieces of this legislation, they were cornerstones for creating relevant momentum for resource recovery discussion at uh, our national level. As you can see, they were just approved uh, two years ago. We can uh, move on further, please. Um, so all of this that, that I've been uh, sharing with, with you has helped us now as a startup company in the wash field, to coin our tropical vision of uh, water resource recovery facility, or as we call here, a sustainable sewage treatment plant. Uh, so sorry for the, uh, the, the names in Portuguese in, in this slide, but, but uh, I'll just uh, guide you through those, uh, through those points. So you may have noticed that we advocate for the mainstream anaerobic sewage treatment as the core of the resource recovery facility. So this is represented in this slide uh, by the UASB reactor fed by the raw sewage. We can go one further, please. So the, the excess sludge from this reactor can be dewatered, for instance, in drying beds, centrifuges, nothing new up to now, and the undergone alkaline stabilization 
for instance, and then we are able with that uh, treated sludge to attend the regulation I previously showed and then apply this material in agriculture, for instance. And when it comes to the liquid phase, the treated sewage itself, we can go one further, please. Uh, following a simple disinfection step, we can produce, for instance, safe water from non-potable uses whose control criteria are now clearly defined in the regulation that I just uh, showed you. And uh, one, one next, please. And we did some efforts in order to show that the payback of such investments, which are represented in this graph for water reuse, for instance, they can be as, shorter, as short as five months in some instances. Okay, so with that in mind, we can go to the next slide, please. And then we start to question ourselves. So what is the main challenge we face at the moment? First, business models for uh, resource recovery, I would say worldwide, they are not uh, fully developed. Conversely, they are, I would say, at their infancy. And moreover, uh, sanitation companies and service providers, uh, mostly in, in, in Brazil right now, they are not 100% convinced of the needs and also the benefits of changing to a circular economy approach. And we are now assembling this puzzle of a so-called uh, so strategic alliance. So we are building bridges between one big sanitation company in Brazil, the one you see in the slides, at the top part of the slides, and the Federal University of Minas Gerais. So the idea, we are seeking to create a platform of innovation and moreover, demonstration of sustainable practices in, in the sanitation sector. And it is very important to stress those uh, demonstration practices, they are fully adapted to the local reality of developing countries. One next, please. And what I would like to young water professionals to, to grasp from this presentation is that we can build intergenerational trusts by being oriented by same goals and knowing our local needs. So, I say this specifically from those of developing countries, as I do believe, and as I do believe that we need to adapt uh, technologies or even inventing new ways for the transition uh, to a circular economy, which should take into account the financial constraints of developing countries. An incubation period in which we can demonstrate how the goals are translated into actions can be very important, as I show you during this presentation and cross collaboration collaboration among different stakeholders in the wash field is the way to go to address the entrepreneurship challenges and build the bridges needed for the transition to a circular economy so with that uh, i would like to thank you very much we can go one next thank you very much for uh, your attention and i'll be happy to answer questions during the the chat thank you very much thank you very much diego for that presentation showing us that um, people from different generations can come together to form a wash enterprise to solve the solutions that um, we are looking for to the challenges in the water sector. So thank you very much for that. So we will have our second poll. How confident are you in becoming a wash entrepreneur after listening to all the presentations today? And should there be a group for both senior and young wash entrepreneurs and other stakeholders to continue this discussion about um, wash entrepreneurship? You have two minutes to answer these questions, then we can move on to the discussions. And a quick reminder, please put your questions in the Q&A session, then the, the panelists and the speakers can address them okay so how confident are you in becoming a wash entrepreneur some hot confident very confident okay, so majority of us are somewhat confident it's good that no one is not confident about becoming a wash entrepreneur so that is great um i think as the discussions continue we will find a way to make everybody confident yeah um, should there be a group for both senior and young wash entrepreneurs and other stakeholders? Yes. Okay. We have 100%. And then 5% says no. That's 1%. Okay. 
that is fine so we will see how best we can move on with that um so we have the question and um answers time please if you have a question put it in the q a session okay uh jacob just uh let us invite all the speakers to open their cameras so the participants can see them during this discussion and yeah. while we have the discussions uh we will be stopping sharing the screen so we will highlight all the speakers okay great so we have question and answers time that's my favorite part of the webinar <laughs> so there is one question here to um abigail so bulua tife is asking i am interested in the advantages of the aquatech system over the conventional float valve used in most water pumping systems as well as its fundamental operating principle hello yeah abigail can hear you now okay do you want me to speak yes please okay thank you so much for showing interest in being part of aquaset ghana we are on instagram so you can connect with me on instagram aquaset ghana when you go on instagram just type aquaset ghana you can send us a message on there or you can also send me an email abigail wilson 331 at gmail.com and then we can connect and you, you can become a partner with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Abigail. Um, Arjun is asking, how does IWE, how, how can IWE help us to scale our automated and IoT enabled wastewater treatment solution? I think that, that is what we are doing, one of the platforms to bring um, stakeholders in the entrepreneurship sector together so that um, we can learn from them, learn about the strategies to use to um, build our enterprises. So Arjun, I think one of such webinars is, is an answer to your question, what IWA can do to help. But um, I think I'll direct this question to Barry. How can uh, um, these type of businesses um, scale up their solutions? Uh, it's a, that's a great question. Um, so uh, IWA and I, I work at the Water Environment Federation, which obviously partners with IWA. The best opportunity for if you're trying to um, bring your new IoT um, technology to, to market is actually to get demonstration projects and the the networks of IWA and other um, groups like WEP and Unleash or whatever are a great opportunity to find those potential people who will actually um, put your put your equipment in place and actually give you the results because it's very important to not just do pilots, um, but to actually do demonstration type projects. And people who are very interested in it, the, the end users um, are going to be what you want to focus on in the um, in any of these um, communities out there. Look for the people who are the end users so that you can uh, not just talk to other just uh, academics or, or researchers, but actually the end users to get some of that demonstration um, sites and then potential opportunities for commercial sales. Thank you very much, Barry. So, um, Aritro is asking, he said, hi, this is Aritro from India. We have a water quality consultancy company that focuses on design of water treatment plants. ETP, STP, is there any way we can collaborate with Tiago and work on completing the cycle in terms of circular economy? I would also like to seek advice regarding the issue of scaling and iron removal, which is a major issue in Northeast, Northeastern India. So, Tiago. Yes, thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Arun, for your your uh, actually your comments. Uh, of course, we can collaborate uh, a lot together because we know that uh, India, you guys, 
You have uh, lots of uh, anaerobic reactors treating, uh, directly treating uh, sewage rights. And as, as I showed during the presentation, we do believe that this is a, a core for our developing countries in the tropical region to, I mean, push forward uh, the agenda of um, uh, circular economy. Of course, we can do uh, a lot together. Right now, we are mostly involved in, in, in projects that we can uh, I mean, look into all of the different aspects related to, to the treatment. Are you, for instance, uh, biogas use, the recover, uh, direct recover of nutrients by, uh, say, directly use using the, the, the treated sewage as a, a, for non-potable uses, for instance, as I presented. So there, I, I do believe that there, there is or there are lots of opportunities to, to collaborate. And I'll just type again in the chat my email and please do not hesitate to, to contact us, of course. Thank you. And the second part of the question, Jacob, I think it's not direct uh, to me, right? I would like to seek advice regarding the issue of scaling and ion removal, which is a major issue in northeastern India. Okay, ion removal. Yes. Okay, maybe this is not directly related to me, but uh, I would say uh, we do not face those kinds of problems here, ion, uh, related to iron removal. And I do believe that maybe this is more related to water treatment than uh, wastewater treatment. I'm not sure if this is the case, right? Yeah. And uh, so I do believe that this is something more related to water treatment. We are not directly involved in those uh, advancements. And yeah, maybe there is some, someone else that can step in and also uh, yeah, collaborate on that, on that answer. Okay. Uh, Barry, do you have experience in that field? Yeah, uh, the, um, I'm not familiar with the specifics of uh, Northeast India. Um, but scaling and iron removal, especially in, in, in water treatment and distribution, like Tiago said, um, is very common worldwide. Uh, I would imagine that IWA has a, uh, a group on water treatment that could, they could post their question to there. Um, also, there's plenty of resources online, companies that, um, provide services and technologies for this, which is actually probably more going to be overwhelming. So I would recommend going through an IWA specialist group first and asking the specific question uh, and, and clarifying a little bit beyond scaling and iron removal. What scaling, uh, where is this industrial? Is this municipal? Um, and iron remo removal, uh, again, is this at industrial? Is this in um, municipal, household level, uh, utility level? Um, so, thank you very much, Barry. Uh, Ines, I would just call on you to. I don't. I know this is your field, so if you have something to say about it. Hi, Jacob. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, because can you please repeat your question? Yeah. So. Um, Aritro is asking um, for advice regarding the use of scaling and ion, the issue of scaling and ion removal. Yeah, um, um, yeah it is my area and um, I was just trying to, to see if I could conjugate what was said, but um, so basically when we're looking into uh, groundwater, then the iron removal is, is quite uh, easily achieved. Uh, did he give any idea on what is uh, large amounts or what what amount would be interesting? No, no yeah. Um, but, um, and we're talking about drinking water. Yeah. Yes. So in my head here, what, uh, what I would say is that open filters with sand filtration could easily work. Um, um, and it could be quite reasonable to, to do it at a filtration rate of about uh, 10 meters an hour, something like this. Uh, but this is my, I mean, if there's any um, specific advice that I can give, um, everyone is just welcome to, to reach me um, because uh, I can be quite geeky about this. The, what I'm worried more here is about actually biological growth uh, in this case, so uh, depending on the conditions that we have on site, 
it could be required to look into disinfection after. So in Denmark, where I sit, we do not use any disinfection technology. Uh, we, we simply uh, treat water through biological processes, meaning that the bacteria themselves are the ones um, removing the, the, the contaminants, including iron. Um, however, there are different geographical areas where the temperature of the water would promote a growth of bacteria that is not good. And in that case, disinfection methods need to be uh, applied. If not UV, then, then chlorination. Um, yes, I, I would also raise here the concern of um, uh, other contaminants such as manganese and ammonium, just because all of those three can be removed with the same technology. And therefore, if you have the same, those contaminants, they can also be removed with sand filtration. So just in case that is also included. Okay. Thank you very much, Ines. So, okay. Ayuba is asking, are there funds for young entrepreneurs? Abigail, Tiago, what have been your experience? Yes, I do believe that's maybe uh, Aki, Dr. Akimo uh, that uh, gave us that nice, very nice and powerful presentation would be the perfect person to answer that, right? Exactly. <laughs> <But> maybe, <laughs> can, yeah, <laughs> maybe we can step in with uh, our Brazilian experience. Uh, so we, 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 we saw we saw from, from, from the presentation, uh, from the video, that uh, we saw that some aspects are, are very important to prepare. So if, if you know uh, your, I would say, the people that will get funding or the institutions that will fund uh, some, 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 some lines and research, I mean, you can be prepared in advance. I'd say that's uh, the most powerful, I would say, uh, advice that I heard during this, uh, during this uh, panel and uh, I would say, that we, we can be prepared in advance. So we can know about uh, the funds that are uh, available. And by knowing the funds, we can be prepared in advance to the moment that they are going to be, I would say, released. Uh, so at least in our experience here, we, we, we at least can map some important institutions and also uh, from the public and also the private sector that, I would say, have this kind of regular uh, calls and then we, we could be prepared for the next one, for instance. I would say that this is indeed a very, uh, I would say, not straightforward, but a very nice way to go in order to, let's say, fundraising. Jacob, I would jump on this since it's something that we work here with IWA um, in terms of looking for opportunities for young water professionals. And there are opportunities. Uh, if you search online, you can find it. I will share some links in the chat. One of the most famous one that we have in terms of um, call for proposals and information about opportunities for young water professionals, you can find in just water jobs. But uh, even with IWA, we've been publishing a lot of opportunities for young water professionals in our uh, web page, uh, our social media, and also in the YWP newsletter. So I do recommend that everyone sign up for the newsletter so you can stay updated um, to all the things that we are sharing there. Yeah, I, I wanted to add this, what has worked for us? So for us at Infotech Lab, and this is something new we started doing this year, right? When you start as a startup, you may not have the expertise or the skill sets in identifying how to go about funding. So you can, look for people who are good in writing for grants and they can actually help you. So we use a website called Fiverr. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R. -R. And they have so many grant writers on there that are familiar with WASH projects, right? So you basically pick and target grant writers who are good in writing grants for water projects or whatever projects you're writing on. And usually they will do the research for you and give you a list of organizations that support water projects, right? So whatever projects you're working on, they'll give you a list of organizations that are willing to provide funding for that particular project. And then they will help guide you to be able to submit applications for funding because I know most of us we have that entrepreneurship skills and we may not have the funding skills when it comes to that right so you don't want to find yourself in a position where you're coming up with good ideas 
but you're missing the ability to submit your application to actually get funding. So that is one of the strategies that we have used so far and it's working for us. And of course, like Isabella said, you can follow organizations that support water projects or whatever projects you're working on. Just do random Google search, you know, network and find those organizations and target them and then find ways that you can apply to their organizations to partner with you to help with the funding. Thank you. Thank you very much for all those responses. Um, someone is asking, what is your advice for people who would like to be WASH sociopreneurs? Do you think there would be a conflict of interest if the initiative is centered on entrepreneurship? How can we balance this social impact and entrepreneurship? I think the person is basically asking for having for profit and not for profit organizations um, in WASH. So, Barry. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, there are there are organization the, the organizational formats like B Corps in some countries, which are kind of a blend of nonprofit and for profit. But that's getting into the technical side, honestly. And I think um, Tiago could probably answer some more on this topic very well. But number one, I don't think there is a a um, conflict of interest between that because I think. We need to have entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship. If you're in a company or an organization or a, you know, like a government entity, you have to use this entrepreneurship um, focus to try new things and learn quickly and pivot um, in order to have that social impact. So in fact, I don't think there's a conflict of interest. I think they're almost required to, as, as complex as uh, the problems are today. Thank you. Any of the may, may I just add very quickly on that? Yeah. I would say just to I mean, add a very, very, very short comment on that, that actually uh, they are not conflicting. Uh, the social, I would say, the social aspect of it, it should be directly linked to the entrepreneurship. I mean, it's a requirement, as Barry says. Uh, so we, we should strive for, 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 for business that are, are social meaningful. That's, that's the point. I would say uh, the financial aspect should be a consequence and not your main driver. If it's your main driver, I do believe that you should rethink a bit. Great. Isabella? Over to you. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, and thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, I saw that the discussions were really interesting and everyone is keen to keep discussing about the topic about uh, entrepreneurship and watch and how to find opportunities and even how to prepare to submit a proposal for a funding. Um, so we will keep that in mind and I hope that you join us in our next event. And at the same time, I want to invite you all to sign up and be an IWA member. You can use this discount code to receive some um, discounting the new membership and you can uh, just go to our website and sign up there. Also, I want to share information about our next webinar that is related to the topic discussed today. So we have this webinar in partnership with uh, UTS on transforming the water and sanitation workforce. We will be discussing a lot about diversity, gender and inclusion practice. So I left the link below, but you can find this information on our website. And I also have some um, information about the Digital Water Summit that we have uh, will happen in Bilbao in Spain. So you can check the website and how to participate. And since we are talking about the opportunities for young water professionals in this topic, um, I invite you all to check these opportunities on capacity development workshop that is organized by the Coffee and Foundation and in partnership with some uh, water youth organizations and from our side, we are also helping preparing, can you go back? Yes, also helping preparing for 
for the activities and it's focused on capacity development and entrepreneurship. So definitely related to this. And the focus uh, is on African uh, young water professionals and entrepreneurs. So just to scan the QR code and check the information that we have there to, to register. Following this, I also have another opportunity related to the topic today is this is the Global Freshwater Challenge. It's organized by the UPLink in partnership with the World Economic Forum and is open to submissions until uh, November 8th. And if you check the, um, uh, if you scan the QR code and check their website, you can find all the focus areas, the criteria that they have it and how to submit it. And I also left the information about the contact person so you can send a mail to Anna and she will be ready to, to guide you on the sub submission. Yes, I think that's all from my side. I hope that you enjoyed this webinar and that you take in consideration everything that uh, the speakers shared. And feel free to reach out to us if you have any kind of questions and comments. Jacob, anything that you want to add? Yes, yeah, so I would also thank you for the time and then spending this time with you all contributing to this webinar. And I thank you to the speakers for the insights that you've shared with us. Um, I believe that we will continue to um, share a lot of more information about um, Washington entrepreneurship, especially for young people, and see how we can help each other to succeed. So look out for the next steps. Yeah.